My name is Speech, I'm from the group Arrested Development. This is how sampling saved the music industry. Um, yo, I'm gonna do things maybe different, that's maybe not different to you, but um, I'm gonna rock certain music here because I, I was gonna do this without doing any music, and then I was like, but this is all about music. And this, at the end of the day, if you don't hear the music that sort of, you know, motivates this whole movement of sampling, then you don't understand what it's about. I know that there is, in any crowd, there's people that hate sampling, so you're like, how in the heck can somebody say this? Because sampling has bastardized the music industry. And then there's other people that love sampling, and I'm glad you're here. I am among one of those people. Um, so, I'm gonna jump right on in. Early sound pioneers experimented with the very definition of music, and I'm gonna rock something like this. Check this out. Um, so, Pierre Schaefer and Pierre Henry, for example, started their own movement of music concrete when they began collaborating back in the 1940s, before tape recorders were even around. They used disc cutters to push the boundaries of music by making unique sound collages. And I'm gonna show you one of those right now while I speak. Help me out if you can't hear me. And um, it's all good. Turn it down just a tad bit while I'm speaking. And then when I'm not speaking, turn it back up for me, okay? And by sound, I mean more than just instruments. They also use the sounds of trains, mechanical noises. Soon, other pioneers such as Carl Heinz, Stockhausen were influenced by Schaefer, and later, even the Beatles, which is what I'm playing right now, dabbled in music concrete, which was basically the early forms of sampling with their experimental track, Revolution 9, from the White Album. Anybody familiar with the White Album by the Beatles? Okay, so these were the humbling beginnings of sampling. Now I'm gonna share with y'all a true story. Anybody know Prince? Anybody Prince fans up in here? Good. I'm a huge Prince fan. So I'm gonna tell you a little story. The most expensive record that I have ever played in my life is this record right here that you're hearing. Prince, Alphabet Street. And uh, I was listening to it. And uh, just wait for it. There's a certain part of this song that I was really moved by because I grew up in this small town of Ripley, Tennessee. And so when I heard this certain word, I was like, man, this is gonna be incredible. So. I'm gonna drive. Yeah. You can sing along if you know some of the words. It's right here. Bam, and I sampled this. To Tennessee. Right there. Now, that was the most expensive record experience I've ever had in my life. And I'll tell you why. Some of y'all know. You see that number right here? Maybe you can't see it up on that screen. $100,000 is what I had to pay for that word. Wow. Tennessee for my man Prince. Now, it actually cost me $100,012 because I also paid for the record. So this naked man right here, this naked man right here waited for my song, which I'm gonna play for you in a minute, my song to get all the way to the top of the charts. And the very week that it went down one notch, from number three to number four, I got a call from the Royal Highness Prince from Minneapolis. I know it's a teacher from Minneapolis. And that brother in his office called and said, yo, we wanna hit you up for a quick hundred grand for using this word, Tennessee. And so that was by far the most expensive record playing experience that I've ever had in my life. I don't know if y'all have had any kind of record that's cost you $100,000, but it cost me that. Anyway, the next record that um, I had to spend a lot of money on, it cost me quite a lot of money to spend on this record, and it goes a little something like this. Just a little shaker, you know what I'm saying? Nothing major. Okay, that little simple thing right there cost me $50,012. $12 because I bought the record. Brand new heavies. Now, these were my guys, so I actually knew these cats, so I called them up personally, and I said, yo, 
can we make some type of deal? Because I just got hit by Prince for that song, you know, for that word, Tennessee. Can we make some kind of deal? And they said no. And um, long story short, we had to make it happen the way it had to happen. So, um, $50,000, they called me up and hit me up as well. So I'm just saying, this stuff could get really expensive very quickly. Um, I was inspired by these artists to make my own art. And so I wrote a song using two of those samples and using some other cool little things that I had in my drum machines. And um, I made a song called Tennessee. And so I want to rock that for y'all just for a second. Tennessee. You see, that's the Tennessee. That's the Tennessee for Prince. Tennessee. That's the shaker you can hear in the background from Brand New Heavy. Tennessee. And then I just did what I wanted. Lord, I've really been distressed down in that losing dress. Although I am black and proud, problems got me pessimistic. Now, check this out. The thing is, yeah, you can clap if you know the song. If you don't know the song, it's all good. So, yo. So the thing is, I was inspired. Now it's funny because a lot of people that hate on sampling, they don't understand that it wasn't that I took these people's songs. The song Alphabet Street to no! totally sounds different. It don't sound like Tennessee. Tennessee. You know what I'm saying? It's just a word. I also used the shaker. It doesn't sound like brand new heavy song. It's a totally different vibe. But I was inspired by the music and it allowed me to create what I created. So the song that some of y'all clap for, Tennessee, was made because I was inspired by the music. So a lot of people don't understand, when they're talking about sampling, it's really just an inspiration. It's not a biting of somebody else's music. It's inspiration. And we all gotta be inspired by something. So, as I told you my name is Speech, I started off as a DJ. And um, I was 13, my dad's nightclub back in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I was born, was um, you know one of those nightclubs for only adults, which I guess all nightclubs are. And you know, I was 13 and I, I used to spin. He used to let me spin music in his nightclub. And so I used to do that. It was a very big passion for me. It was my first foray into music. But then, you know, I tried, I tried my hands at, you know, sort of um, classic train, you know, guitar playing and things of that nature. It just wasn't my thing. Now, I know some of you guys here are really great at that, but it wasn't my thing. So I failed at guitar when I did those lessons. I tried to take drums in school, but my... My uh, te a music teacher tricked me into playing trombone first and said, I'll get to drums later. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. They did the old switcheroo. And, um, but nonetheless, I excelled at sampling. And so I love sampling, and that's what I wanted to stick with. Well, because of sampling and, of course, a lot of live instrumentation, I was later to create a record that many in the hip-hop world look at as a, as a really foundational piece of music. It was along with me and my band, Arrested Development. We've been, we've been doing this for over 25 years. So a lot of this that you're hearing from me, I wanted to share these personal stories because it's very personal to me how amazing and how instrumental sampling is. But I think I have a lot of facts that also go along with my personal experience that make this a very interesting reality. So anyway, my records, you know, along with Arrested Development, my group, we did songs like People Every Day, songs like Mr. Wendell, Tennessee Revolution. We won two Grammys. Um, Back in 1993, we've, with this album actually that I'm showing you, three years, five months, two days in the life of. So, how sampling came to rescue the music industry for the first time. This is my opinion. Some of you guys are publishers out here. Publishers' job is to get music from an artist and try to expose it to as many various outlets as possible. In my opinion, sampling and the sample culture, the people that sample, they're doing the best publisher in the world's job for you. So in other words, if publisher's job is to get your music out there, get it to various places, make you more money because of it, the sampling culture is doing a better job of that than any publishing company has ever done in the history of music. Because the people that love sampling, they go and they get your records and they do what's called crate digging. They do what's called buying records, going to the record store and actually buying records, not just getting the sounds from online, but buying records. It's fan driven. And so crate digging, buying records is part of the heart and blood of true music industry um, monetization. But it also does something even more than that. It increases the, um, the, uh, the ability for artists to get discovered. And to me, that's the biggest thing. Like even with the internet age that we're now in, you can get your music distributed anywhere via the internet. 
But you cannot get your music discovered easily because of the internet. There's just so much stuff out there that is very, very tough to be able to get your joints heard by a lot of people. You need ways to get discovered. And sampling is the best way that I have ever seen for artists that normally would be unknown to become discovered by millions of people via sampling. So it came to rescue the industry, and I'll explain to, to you what that means. Worldwide consumers all around the entire planet got crazily excited about creativity and about collaboration. We as human beings, in my opinion, are made to create. Whether it's through the arts or whether it's through a program or whether it's through making other human beings, we are made to create. And we are also made with this innate feeling to want to collaborate with somebody else. We can't live by ourselves. We can't live in a bubble by ourselves. We have to have interaction with other people. And so sampling to me makes total sense because it's an innate feeling that I want to create something, but I also want to collaborate with something that somebody else has already created. So sampling against all the, because the, there's some high profile people that said some really bad things about sampling and they even go as far as to try to get rid of the art and say that you're not an artist because you sample and you need to learn how to play music, you need to learn how to, the scales and you need to learn. And it's, it's, they're, they're misunderstanding the point about sampling. Sampling is all about music appreciation at its core. And when it's done correctly, it's all about music appreciation as opposed to depreciation. We are not thieves. We're not vultures. We are truly music's biggest fans. And that's my wholehearted um, feeling about it, and I'm sticking to it. We're not looking for opportunity. In fact, most people that sample understand that they will never make it huge. They will never make it huge, but they're looking to be moved. So a lot of times when they're grabbing something from vinyl and they're, and they're, they're playing it, they're just looking for something to be moved. A lot of, I, I'm, I've been in this industry forever, and a lot of the people that I know that sample, they're not looking for some hit song that they could just rob and grab. If it moves them, I'm not saying it never happens, it definitely does, but that's not the point. They wanna feel something. They wanna feel something that they haven't felt before. And when they feel it, now they wanna participate. They wanna participate with that particular person or persons, whoever those artists are that they're sampling, they wanna participate in that process with this person. Never met the person. Never probably will meet the person, but they want to get involved with what that person has just created. And at the heart of it, that is just an innate part of our humanity. They want to participate. They want a communion with that artist. They want to intersect with that artist. And it's the same reason people do this at concerts. Anybody ever done this at a concert? Just wave your hands in the air. And now that has nothing to do with what you paid your ticket price for. It has nothing to do with whether the artist is gonna continue on or not. But what it is, is it's interaction and it's participation, and everybody loves that, and when the crowd is able to do that, wave their hands, or they're able to put their hands up, it's like, I'm with you. And right now, we're, we're having a moment here. And that's what sampling is as well. Just like any true fan of any music, they wanna get in on the action. And so that's what a sampler, a person that samples does. It's the same reason that music is not supposed to be a spectator sport. So classical music is probably a little different. I don't do a lot of classical concerts, I must admit. But I've seen it in the sense on TV and what have you, and I think they just sort of sit there and wait until the whole thing's over. But even when they clap, I guess that's their form of waving the hands in the air. So nonetheless, some of the origins of this art of sampling. We know that it comes from back in the day with the cats from Germany and all of that, but I think the ways that we really look at it nowadays comes from people like I'm about to mention. My man, Africa Bambata, the father of hip hop, DJ Cool Herc, all of that from the Bronx, New York. And um, yo, first release that Africa Bambada dropped was really, really fresh, Planet Rock. Oh, yeah. Anybody ever heard of this joint right here, Planet Rock? Now this joint right here, ironically, did not have a lot of samples in it, but it's still, the essence of it is still from the culture of sampling. I'll show you why. My man, they got this from this. Y'all ever heard of Kraftwerk? Anybody ever heard of Kraftwerk? Kraftwerk right there, that's where they got the Planet Rock beat from. Like, 
You see what I'm saying? It's that same vibe. Now, Kraftwerk was a band out of Germany. A lot of people wouldn't even know who Kraftwerk was, but see, when Africa Bambada got involved, he was like, yo, I love this record by Kraftwerk. It's in Germany. And now everybody in the States is familiar with Kraftwerk, and Kraftwerk is somebody that a lot of people can raise their hands on because they knew about it from a man, Africa Bambada, who did something like that. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm talking about. Sampling is a culture that discovers new music. But not only did it do that, it also innovated technology. Turntables, samplers, mixers, DAWs, all of that type of stuff. It innovated new technology. A lot of y'all ever heard of the MPC? Anybody ever heard of the MPC drum machine? Anybody ever heard of the SB1200? That's back in the days for those that have been around for a while. That was, uh, you know, saying the turntable is the 1200, but the SP1200 was the DJ beatbox. Early days of hip hop, you know what I'm saying? But even the mixers, the turntables initially were not used for people to sample and stuff like that. Initially, it was just to play records. And when the record faded out, it faded out. And then, when hip hop got involved and the art and the mindset of sampling got involved, they used to loop the breaks, the breakdown in the record, and that's where we get all of these joints from right here. So people used to loop these joints. And that's what I'm talking about. That's the innovation and the freshness of sampling that brought about a whole new world of music. Anybody ever heard of this joint? Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, you know this one. What's this called? You don't know what this is called. This is by my man Ronnie Foster. An original record is Mystic Blue, Brew. But you know this sample, don't you? Who knows this joint right here? Okay, you can clap your hands. It's all right. We celebrate music up in here. It's good. This is Tribe Called Quest. Electric, electric relaxation. Now check this out. But see, it came from this. You see what I'm saying? But the reason we all love it and we're vibing to it in 2015 is because this dude right here, Ronnie, made this record. He made this record, but y'all didn't know about Ronnie. And that's all good. But you did know about this joint right here. But see, that's the art of sampling. So then when y'all are moved by certain music, even if it comes from somewhere else, it's not a disrespect to the artist it comes from, it's actually a respect. It's paying respect to the artist that it comes from. It's giving them respect. So that's the whole, that, you know, that's the whole different thing that people don't think about. So Tribe Called Quest made Electric Relaxation. It went all across the world. Everybody loves that record. It's one of their favorite records on the entire catalog of Tribe, but it comes from Ronnie Foster, Mystic Brew. Now the same way a concert makes you love a band, sampling does that very thing too. But it's even better than, you know, concerts to some extent, because you don't even have to ever tour as an artist. And you still can get people to fall in love with your art. You as an artist become extremely relevant to people across the world, even if they've never actually seen you live in concert and they never touched you in any personal way. It's a whole nother avenue and way for you to get involved with an artist. So, what we're gonna do right here is go back. Way back, back into time. Yes, indeed. I wanna share with y'all why the industry needed saving in the first place. Billboard charts back in 1979, the Hot 100. This is the top of the charts in 1979, and I feel like we needed a lot of saving. And so, top of the charts was people like the Bee Gees. BGs was hot, don't get me wrong, I like the BGs, but I'm just gonna show you a little difference on what was going on back then. So I'm just rock this right here. Turn it down a little tad bit, please. And I'm gonna talk about something. So, top of the charts in 1979 was the BGs. We had Chic, we had Rod Stewart, we had Gloria Gaynor, Doobie Brothers, Peaches and Herb, Donna Summers. Basically, it was a disco era of the 70s. And so you see my man here, John Travolta, he's putting one finger up. We all know about those days. We all know about these fresh outfits over here with the rainbow, the rainbow colors. I know y'all got some of that in your closet. And then um, you got the Bee Gees down here in the far right. And um, Bee Gees, I mean, just look at the vibe of them right there, though. I mean, I like the Bee Gees. I'm not hating on the Bee Gees. But they got a lot of makeup on. They got the suntan lotion on. And they got the, the V-neck shirts that go way down to the belly button. And they look a little, you know, they look a little, you know, I don't know. It's, it's like, put it this way. <laughs> See, what, what, the, what the interesting thing about it is, is this. In the 60s, it was total music exploration going on. So in the 1960s, I mean, everything was going on. It was no boundaries. You got Jimi Hendrix, Lionel Family Stone, you got James Brown. You got all of this stuff going on. 
and the nation felt like it was going to absolutely explode. Practically everybody in our entire country in the 60s stood for a cause, whether it was black people with black pride, white people with us, equal rights for women, sexual freedom, getting out of Vietnam, freedom of religion. But by the 70s, in the 80s, the pendulum swung on the opposite side of the scale and it became very commercialized and homogenized. Everybody sort of fall, fell in line. And everybody sort of had this look like, right, we see with the, B, you know, with, with the Bee Gees. And it was all about glam, it was about glitter, it was about sell you a dream instead of sell you the dream. You know, in the 60s, Martin Luther King died for the dream. He's talking about blacks and whites holding hands together, being all these things that were very real, very tangible. And in the 70s, they wanted to sell us a dream. We was going to the discos, we had the disco lights, we had the smog and the fog and the disco, and everybody had bell bottoms, and it was colors, and it was rainbows, and it, every, you know what I'm saying? It was a totally different thing that they was pushing on us. And many people were overdosed on reality, and wanted just a commercial escape. And then songs like this made total sense. Turn it up. Good time. So, everybody saying good times. My man in the shirt down here was saying, no, disco sucks. But most people were saying good times, good times, good times. Hey, anybody know about this track right here? The original Good Times by Sheik. You can make some noise for them. Sheik is a good man. Come on. So check it out. Now, in 1979, however, Rapper's Delight came out. Now, that's the first real big rap record that really made it to the mainstream. And rap came out of a different vibe than the whole glam glitter thing. Because the people in the rap community in the Bronx and New York, these people was coming from desperation and poverty. It was gang violence going on. So when Africa Bambada and these cats was talking about hip hop, they wasn't trying to talk about glam and glitter and discos and, and all of that, let's escape the world. They couldn't escape the world. They would have wanted to, but they couldn't. So they had to deal with things a little bit more raw and a little bit more real. So on September 20th and 21st in 1979, Blondie and Sheik were playing concerts with The Clash in New York at the Palladium. When Sheik started playing good times, then, my man, rapper, Five Five Freddy, which I know this cat right here in the, in, the, in the screen that you see right here, and the members of Sugar Hill Gang, rest in peace, Big Bang Hank, my man, Mark Wright, yeah, Mike, Mike Wright, give Big Bang Hank some love, Big Bang Hank, Master G, which is my favorite of the Sugar Hill Gang, I love this voice. They jumped in on stage and started freestyling with the band as they was rocking this song right here. A few weeks later, Nile Rodgers was on the dance floor at another New York club called Leviticus, and he heard the DJ play a song which opened with this bass line. Do, 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 do. From Sheik's Good Times. Now, Niles Rodgers approached the DJ and said, yo, he said, I just got this record. I just bought it in Harlem. This is what the DJ was telling Niles Rodgers. And the song turned out to be an early version of Rapper's Delight which also included a scratch of the song's string section, and Rogers, now Rogers and Edwards immediately threatened legal action over the copyright, which resulted in a settlement, and they're being credited as co-writers on this song. So, my man now Rogers, which I think he owes a lot to hip-hop, because prior to hip-hop, look at that Jerry Curl, and after he got with hip-hop, he was with Daft Punk just about a couple years ago, and he looks real fresh, right? Now Rogers did a, he did a makeover, ladies and gentlemen, a makeover, hip-hop. Props to sample and culture. You know what I'm saying? So, let me tell you something about Daft Punk. They believe in sampling. They believe in it. And not only that, Pharrell, when they made that track, Get Lucky, Pharrell believes in sampling. He's a huge fan of the art form of it. And the reason that he even chose Now Rogers is not just because Now Rogers is an amazing producer, an amazing guitarist, but he chose him because he knows the culture of sampling and he fell in love with Now Rogers from records just like this. He fell in love with Nile Rodgers. See, that's what happens when sampling is allowed to flourish and, and bloom, is that you start to understand who the musicians are. You may not do it right off the bat. You may just sample because you love the loop. But after a while, and after you've lived with it for a while, you start to understand who every single person on that record is. You start to understand more of their catalog and you dig deeper and deeper and deeper. I think something that's pretty interesting is this. This is Nile Rogers' quote. Now, initially, he was against the whole artist sampling. He wanted to sue everybody, get that song off the radio. He says, I was originally upset with Rapper's Delight, but now it's one of my favorite songs of all time. As innovative and important as Good Times was, Rapper's Delight was just as much, if not more so. So, it saves the industry because songs that was fresh, Good Times was fresh, but Rapper's Delight, it's fresher. 
And in good times, they still get to make money from it. But Sugar Hill Gang, Rapper's Delight, all the reversion, I mean, remakes of Rapper's Delight, remakes of Good Times, everybody's happy because sampling got involved. Nobody was dissed out of sampling. Sampling saves the music industry. And if you're not convinced, I got more. <laughs> show me, show me, show me. Yeah, show me. Yeah. So, right here. Anybody know this song right here? Yeah. Turn it up a little bit. Yeah, this is Rocket by my man Herbie Hancock. Certain people got involved with sampling right off the beginning. They wasn't hating on it. Now, Herbie Hancock is an accomplished musician. He is a compositionist among compositionists. I've toured with Herbie. This cat is a really cool cat. Check. That's Scratching by my man Grand Mixer DSD. Huh. Like that. You see what I'm saying? But that's sampling. Herbie Hancock did not diss this music. He said, man, let me get involved with it right now. He was one of the first people to get involved with it and make it even bigger than what it already was on the underground. And I love that about my man Herbie. But not only Herbie did that, people like Blondie got involved. Malcolm McLaren, anybody know about Malcolm McLaren? Art of Noise, anybody ever heard of Art of Noise? Oh yeah. Okay, Malcolm McLaren was involved with that whole movement. They embraced this music and it would serve them extremely well in the music industry. Not just in the realms of discovery, but in the realms of, of, of bringing them back to the essence of, of, of popularity, but also making ends meet for them. A lot of good stuff came from that. This song is called Buffalo Gals, right? It's by Malcolm McLean. Yeah, the beat is a little low on this because it's a little out of phase, but nonetheless. This is one record that, just like old records used to do back in the Beatles days, they used to have all the drums on one side of the speaker and have all the instrumentation and vocals on the other side of the speaker. Well, Malcolm McLaren decided to do that because he was influenced by the sample culture. He knew that these old records did that. He just, as a homage to them, he did it like this as well. So that's why you don't hear the beat right now. Uh, uh. Well, I got scratched and it's making me itch. Yeah. Now. Okay, a lot of that is all scratching in various samples from other records. Y'all ever remember this big hat that Pharrell, uh, he rocked it at the 19, uh, 2014 Grammy Awards? Y'all ever seen that hat? Yeah, that was a big, the hat got its own Twitter name. I literally had a Twitter account. And, and so even fashion, like even fashion got picked up from the sample culture. Because the only reason why Pharrell knew about Malcolm McLaren was because back in these days, that song I just rocked right there, Do You Like Scratching, was hot on the breakdance scene. And everybody that looked, loved the breakdance knew about that track right there. And so, stuff like that made him know about Malcolm McLaren, which made him then understand that there was this big old buffalo hat that Malcolm McLaren designed, and he wanted to rock it again in 2015. Then it gets its own Twitter account. You see what I'm saying? Sampling brings up things that is important and should be, it's just fresh. That's all I can say, it's important, it's cool, it's, it's just, it's bright. You know what I mean? So, Herbie had brand new hits in the 80s. This brother was an accomplished musician regardless of these new hits, but nonetheless, everybody in the industry loves a new hit. If you're in the music industry, you love to get a new hit. Herbie had a new hit strictly because of the sampling culture. Strictly because of hip hop culture and how hip hop loved the art of sampling. It brought new blood to his already awesome legacy career. It brought whole new fresh uh, air to the industry and a lot of artists embraced the underground art form of sampling and found huge success because, because of it. And I want to give a shout out to Grand Mixer DST because that was the first DJ on TV that a lot of people that didn't live in New York was ever able to see actually scratching live. And Grand Mixer DJ, uh, DST did a service to all DJs, all turntablists across the planet Earth. Because when they saw him do that, they actually, if they didn't live in New York, could actually see for the first time how someone was making that noise that they heard on record. So he gets props in my book. Increase the interest in live music. Sampling does that. It's ironic, because a lot of people think, well, if you learn live music, then you'll, you know, if you learn an instrument, then you'll really appreciate live music. No. That is one way, obviously, but the other way is sampling increases the interest in live music because we start to understand the aesthetic of it. And we start to understand that drum machines can't always copy that. And we start to understand that there's a need to have live instrumentation on records if we want this particular feel, if we want that particular feel. These are things that people that sample understand, but not only that, sampling revitalized the entire economy of music. So, on into the 90s, Sampling made live music more popular instead of less popular. 
Hip hop heads wanted to get live musicians on their records because they wanted that live sound. But they didn't want to just do it how they already did it back in the 70s. They wanted that sound to be transformed into the new paradigm of how sampling does it, or how hip hop would do it. They didn't want it to be just a literal replica of the 70s and the 60s and the 80s and so on and so forth. And so you got joints like, now right here, my man Carlos Santana had not had a hit for many, many years, and he was rebirthed with this track right here from a perspective of everybody, young and old, knowing who he was. Now, everybody from the past already loved Carlos Santana, but the youth, just like today, a lot of people, when, Con when Kanye West dropped his new single, a lot of people was like, yo, this new dude, uh, Paul McCartney, he's gonna get a lot of love from this new joint right here by Kanye West. Whoever that Paul McCartney dude is, he needs to give love to Kanye. Now, that's how a lot of young people think about older musicians. And that's all good, but sampling, it changes that paradigm. It allows people to know who these people are, which is why, by the way, Kanye West loved Paul McCartney, because he's a sample head. He knows him not just because the Beatles was huge, he already knew that in this day and age, people didn't even know who the Beatles were. They didn't know who Paul was. But in this day and age, he still shows that respect because he came from that world of, look, this is the music I sampled. I love Paul McCartney. I get Paul McCartney. This dude's a legend. Whether anybody else gets him or not, I get him because I sample his stuff. I love this stuff. This is the real deal. So that's what I'm saying. So songs like this. Turn this up. Songs like this right here. Samples all through it. But also, what's really cool about this joint, uh, it's got my man, that's Roger Troutman. Now, a lot of people didn't even know who Roger Troutman was of this generation. But because Dre and Tupac listened to, they listened to this. They knew this song. And because they knew this song and they sampled it so much, they knew Roger Troutman, they knew Zap. And they was like, yo, when we do a track, I want this dude on my record. And so a whole new generation, and now if you got this picture down in the bottom here, I don't know if it shows it on there. You see Tupac, but you know who's also on that video? California uh, Love, Roger Troutman. All over that joint. Now, Roger was really grateful for that, because now people of that older, I mean, younger generation didn't even know who Roger Troutman was. So when people say that sample is just taking someone else's style, you're just flat wrong. What it did is it caused discovery for a whole new planet Earth, a fresh batch of planet Earth humanitarian humans to understand who the heck was Roger Troutman. And now what they do, those that are really digging his vibe, they go back and they check out Roger Troutman. They say, yo, who's this Roger Troutman? Maybe they're trying to sample it. Maybe they're just wanting to listen to it. But they now know who Roger Troutman is. The same difference with R. Kelly did that to my man, the Isley Brothers. The same difference with all types of artists who do that over and over again. My man, Guru, rest in peace to Guru from Gangstar. Anybody know about Guru? Yeah. You know what I'm saying, Sergio Mendez, you know, Guru, he put all types of stars from back in the day. Uh, Roy Ayers, all types of stars on his, on his joints, on his Jazzmatazz joints. Sergio Mendez, his timeless record was his biggest record in decades. Why? Because he embraced the young generation. The young generation was on sampling. Why did they even want to do anything with Sergio Mendez? Because they got Sergio Mendez. They understood his stuff from sampling. They got it. Who sampled? Are you from there? What's up, baby? Who sampled is a great website. This is what they do 24 seven, is these cats tell people, you know, what, what sample came from. Stand up for one second, baby, for a second, for the people. Give love to this dude. They reached out to me knowing I was gonna do this. I'm glad y'all came. Thank you. So, you know, the point is, is that collaboration started happening. It wasn't just sampling the music, it started off that way. But what it also began to do, because they had an intimate respect for these artists, they wanted to collaborate with them in real life, not even just sample with it. And for the, for the young people, it was an honor. And for the old people, it was respect to them. It's like it wasn't a diss to them, it was respect. Let me tell you that um, now Rogers had to realize the chart positions and the sales of anyone's original tunes by and large, will never be compared to how popular those same songs are because of someone sampling it and switching it up and making it different for a new generation. <coughs> and this is proven time and time and time again, and I'll show you some more examples. But sampling even changed the artwork that artists use. So it's not even just the music, because once the music gets in your spirit and in your soul, 
If that music resonates with you, you're looking at the cover of that music differently. You're looking at the cover like, man, and even the cover's fresh. And so now, when you're putting out a cover, you may very well use the exact same design that was initially created in the 60s. You look at um, the Beat Nuts, right? So the Beat Nuts was a hip hop group, is a hip hop group. They used the basically exact same design as Hank Mobley. But the reason they did that is not just because Blue Note designs are incredibly cool, but they were already immersed in the music because of sampling it. And once they got so immersed in it, now you see it, it's all throughout pop culture, but that's all evidences of the success of how sampling changes, not only the music industry, but the mindset, the art, the fashion, all of these things, sampling changed all of that. Blue Note became larger than ever before because of the sample culture, and I'm sticking to that, because people wouldn't even know who Blue Note is. They would later have Nora Jones, they had huge hits, they had a huge resurgence, Jill Scott, but I'm telling you, People in the sampling culture already knew about Blue Note, and I believe that that allowed Blue Note to have some relevance as the future continued to change the culture and everything like that. Radio. A lot of people look at radio. Radio could never do what sampling does for music. And the main reason is because radio is still, at the end of the day, ad-driven, which means they're gonna play anything they gotta play, but at the end of the day, they're looking for ads. Sampling, on the other hand, is 100% music-driven. It's creativity driven. Most of the people that sample, you can ask them, they don't just go grab the biggest, hottest record, although they may do that, I've said that before, but at the end of the day, it's what moves them. It's things that they think is incredible. And most of the hit records that you'll hear that sample, which you don't hear a lot more of it, as much of it today, and I'll explain that in a minute. A lot of that stuff is not very popular stuff. A lot of it is stuff that you probably wouldn't even know existed if it wasn't for the art of sampling. So radio could never do, it's one method of discovery, but sampling is a way better method for discovery in the long run, because it goes for everybody, not just the hit makers, it goes for stuff that was overlooked. It goes purposely for the stuff that was overlooked. So the incentive with sampling is better, it's more pure than radio. Sampling saves, it doesn't hurt the music industry. James Brown sampled 4, 000, over 4,765 times. Now, James Brown, legend. Absolute legend. I got some stories about James Brown I'll share with some of y'all another day. But I have a lot of time. He struggled big time in the 80s. His last hit was in the 70s. And so a decade later, he was struggling. There was nothing going on with James Brown. Um, hip hop came into the play, saved James Brown's music career. Came back, his first single he came back with in the 80s was initially with Africa Bambada, who I shared with you earlier. Africa Bambada was a sample head. He loved sampling. The first song was Unity. That's what James Brown came with. That wasn't a hit. But then right after that, of all these people that were sampling James Brown in the 80s, James Brown became relevant in pop culture. They asked him to do Living in America for the Rocky film. That became his first hit in the 80s. Right. To my knowledge, he hasn't had a hit since then. My point is, sampling brought that man's career back to a place where the new generation loved him just as much as the old generation. He deserves all the respect. The point is, Sampling helped his career, never heard it. So, sampling also brings about multiple revenue streams for artists. When it's done correctly, and there's some things I'll share with you about U42, it's a company that I'm a part of and I'm a president of the music division, um, but when it's done correctly, it makes artists tons of money. And it's a good thing. Like I said, James Brown was sampled almost 5,000 times by various people, but well, all of those made him various different revenue streams. I think he was sampled way more than that. But that's what's on record. And I got that from y'all. Public Enemy sampled almost 2,000 2, times. George Clinton sampled almost 1,500 times. Lynn Collins, anybody ever heard of Lynn Collins? Yeah, yeah you can give her love, that's all good. Okay, let me play that. Sampled 1,252 times. I sampled that part. Let me tell you. Okay, so we got that joint. 
So my point is, a lot of people wouldn't even know who Lynn Collins is. But that joint right there made Lynn Collins very, very famous to a lot of people around this world. Discovery and sampling is off the meters. Bob James, I sampled him with one of our hit songs. Michael Jackson, Cool in the Gang, The Beatles, Isley Brothers. You can look at how many times these people got sampled. Tons of times. We're not just talking about a, you know, maybe 20 or 30 covers of famous people. That's different. Covers, anybody can do covers as well. But sampling goes to a whole nother level. People love this music and they want to get involved with it. It gave the world new incentive that going backwards was needed to go forward. Sheik was 356 times. Prince, Prince had a weird sampling, you know, belief. He didn't like people to sample anything of his, so he would try to fight against you as much as possible or charge you $100,000 for a word. Tennessee, ladies and gentlemen, I have social issues. I have emotional issues. I need help after this. We gonna have a, we have a group meet. We gotta, we have to have a talk. We have to have a talk. I'm just, I'm just messing with y'all. We did good with that song. Bill Withers to the Beatles, Joe Tex to Aerosmith, sampling boosted their careers. We all know James Brown. We all know Billie Holiday. Kanye just sampled her again on his last record. We know Funkadelic. We know Sly Stone. People know Aerosmith in an intimate way, in a way that they probably would not remember that rock crew if it was not for things like this right here. I don't know if Errol Smith understands this, but the fact of the matter is they would not be in pop culture, and I believe they wouldn't even be on American, whatever they're on right now, Steven Tyler, if it was not for this record right here, which understood sampling culture and brought that dude back from obscurity to having some relevancy to a whole other generation. Y'all know this joint right here? Some of y'all too young. This is Run DMC. We can give him a shout out. Run DMC is nice. Okay. Rest in peace, Jam Master J. Rest in peace. That's exactly right. And his cuts were so nice on that. That was so, oh, so crisp. So, do we think less of these artists? No. We think more about these artists because of sampling. That's what I don't understand when people try to hate on sampling. James Brown just had a movie out. Ray Charles had a movie. Steven Tyler is on uh, whatever TV show. So let me just say, what we know about sampling is music appreciation, discovery. It's better than radio and concerts. I'm not dissing radio nor concerts, but it's better than that. It gives you multiple streams of income. It challenges and changes the entire culture, whether it's in art, fashion, and music. Think about the diversity of who and what was sampled. It goes across the entire spectrum of music. It didn't just stick to one certain style. It broadened the entire music landscape and it caused amazing amounts of discovery for artists. In my opinion, the worst thing about today's radio is the lack of diversity. The same old thing that the late 70s suffered from when I showed you those charts and what people look like with that makeup and the suntan lotion. Now, side note, I want to give props to my man Jay-Z because him and Kanye just had a court case that actually won where the court found that them sampling the word O oh, in Run This Town Tonight was a single vowel and did not deserve copyright protection. Now, a lot, a lot of people, yeah, we could clap for that. A lot of people are hating on sampling, like, well, well the, the artists deserve this money, so on and so forth. We got to think of better ways to get the artists that created these songs paid. But the way it is presently, it only shackles sampling, which doesn't help the industry, and it shackles the artists. A lot of people think the artists are getting cut out of money. That's what the publishing companies would love for you to believe. But I talk to the artists, I am an artist, I talk to these artists, and a lot of times, unfortunately, they're not getting the latter share of this money regardless. The publishing companies are getting most of this money. And I'm not against publishing companies, I understand they have a role to play. But my point is, you don't attack the hand that feeds you. These are people that love your music. These are people that celebrate your music. So we gotta find a more creative way to let them celebrate the music and still everybody can get paid. And I think we have some ways that can happen. So I'll share that with you in just a minute. Sampling laws, the way they are right now, stunted the growth of music. We gotta change those things. Because only the richer artists can afford it. They can charge you whatever they choose to charge you. $100,000 for the word Tennessee, or they charge you 20000 5,000, there's no rules, there's no regulations really. It's just lawyers that come up with a fee. I'm telling you the truth, that's a fact. There is no rigid system or if it's this long, it's this much, no, that is not true. Trust me, because of the master usage of that sample, they can charge you whatever they choose to charge you. I've lived this, this is not just my opinion. Whoever, whoever heard of the um, Ponderosa Twins? Show of hands. Word up, good. Few people heard of them, I'm glad. Um, 
I want to give love to my man Kanye. He brought back a really great track. And um, this is his song. And he has this real obscure girlfriend named Kim Kardashian. And it's like, they did a video together. You know, sampling helped her to get, no, I'm just kidding. That's a whole other type of sampling. We ain't gonna talk about that. Okay, so you know that song right there. You, you guys know that song? Okay, legendary singer Charlie Wilson from the Gap Band is rocking on that song. He's singing the chorus, right? Yep. The reason Kanye picked Charlie Wilson was not because he's just a great vocalist. There's tons of new great vocalists that's out right now. But Charlie, don't get me wrong, he's among the best vocalists out there. But he picked Charlie because he understood sampling culture. Yes. He knew the Gap Band. And that's where he fell in love with Charlie. It wasn't just because, well, he's a great vocalist and, you know, everybody's using him, you know, at whatever rates and he's a great session vocalist. That's not how it works. He was inspired by Charlie already, so he used him on that record. So Ponderosa Twins, a lot of people didn't even know that they existed, but of course, Kanye did and he rocked it. So that's what I'm saying. So this is the original joint right here. So there's right there. So my point is basically, is that, oh gosh. So my man, I was just with this guy last weekend, I think it was, or two weekends ago. We was, yeah, we was at Selma, Alabama together. I, I you know, I give props to this dude. He's, he did something really cool with this record right here. Um, so, y'all know this joint right here? Y'all know the original? Oh yeah. There you go, yeah. Queen and David Bowie under pressure. And that's that joint. Everybody really got to know this song from the younger generation. They got to know this one. Let's kick it. All right, stop. Okay, we gonna stop. So, um. <laughs> Well, it's funny though, let me tell you, all black crowd in Selma, Alabama, and he rocked that joint, everyone went nuts. Because whether you loved his whole career or not, the fact is, that song right there gets a response. People love that song, and that sample is hot. That's just all there is to it. So you put that on as a DJ, it's gonna get a response, period. Um, how many people ever heard of La Bise Safri, Cypher, or something like that? Yeah, I know you have. Um, he knows about all these joints right here. But my name is Eminem, sample this joint on his record. Hi, my name is that one, that one right there. Again, a discovery technique. Otis by Kanye and Jay-Z used Try A Little Tenderness by Otis uh, Redding. And they even named the song after the artist. Now Chuck D was upset about that, and I love Chuck D, that's one of my guys, one of my friends. But the point still is, is a discovery of Otis Redding's music was like off the charts because of all of this. So there's so many examples of all of that that I could go into. I'm running out of time, so I won't go into it. But the point is, even a lot of engineers make tons of money be because they accepted the art of sampling. Bob Powers was a great engineer, but he became even greater. You give him love, those that know him. You give him love, but he became a bigger engineer because of Tribe Roots and, and embracing the sample culture instead of hating on it. Early rap used beat machines, and they would have killed music by only having to stick to beat machines. There needed to be more diversity. There needed to be a disruptive force, something unexpected to breathe life back into music. <coughs> Through hip-hop sampling, it saved the industry. So today, music styles are again stuck in a rut. Country songs, there's this whole you know, blog that goes around. Country songs are a lot of times using the exact same changes, a lot of the exact same music structures. The rise of synthesizers and drum machines is great. We love all of that. But it also has changed the music soundscape to where everyone has again got homogenized. Everyone's sort of in one vein, and if you, stick, if you go out of that vein, it's sort of not accepted as much. Now there's some artists that's pushing the boundaries of that, and I'm, I'm grateful for every artist that ever does that. But in general, the homogenization is back again, just like it was in the late 70s. A world without sampling looks like this, especially in hip hop. 
And that's not a caricature, I'm not trying to diss none of that. I'm just simply saying, that's the facts. I just pulled this right off the, when you look at the hip hop charts, that is the ones that's on it. So I'm saying, without that diversity anymore, we got a more uniform vibe, and I believe that it matches with the fact that we're not able to pull from a lot of things because of all the strict sample laws. And not only that, I think we also got a nation divided as it was in the late 70s where you had the Bee Gees with the makeup and the suntan lotion, but then you also had what was bubbling up underneath, which was Africa Bambada and them cats trying to fight against gang violence and coming up with Planet Rock and all of this stuff and Rapper's Delight. You got this two worlds, because right now in the charts as well, you got this. But both of them, if you really look at it, it's just two separate ends of the spectrum, but nothing in the middle. It's nothing to fill it in. You got basically super pop artists that, you know, it's all very, very pop melody driven, which is cool, I'm not against that. But then you also got super hard stuff and you have nothing in between that has all these various textures and colors and, and that's because sampling is no longer affordable for many artists. People can't sample so they can't get all of these various inspirations. It's just very tough and with the, with the studios being right in your house, it's very unlikely for every artist to be able to get some huge group of bands and strings and all of that, what we used to do in the 70s and 60s. It's not gonna happen very likely. The budgets aren't even that huge in the music industry anymore. And so, you know, you look at the pop charts, you got One Direction, so on and so forth. You see the contrast, there's no diversity. We need sampling back in this industry. I'm gonna skip it to get to this. Sampling can work again. And this was back in the 90s, we had diversity, so on and so forth. I'm gonna get you this joint. I became a president of a music uh, division of this company, U42. And U42 is a company that the only reason I became president of this is so I could tell people about the need to bring sampling back into this world today and how it should be saving this industry once again because I think the industry needs saving. And I think that if you allow artists to sample and we have a way to do that. So I got my cards right here and um, I want y'all to, you know, Check out the cards. I'd love to share with you some more about what we're doing. Go to our website, you can see a little bit more. But because time is short, I'm gonna be out of here and I appreciate y'all's love.